This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. This topic, same-sex marriage, is a natural uh, for uh, our interest in why history matters because uh, of the importance of seeing marriage as a historical rather than a divine institution, because of the importance of historical testimony to this case, and uh, Nancy Cott's uh, graciousness in coming will uh, reinforce that because of the presence of the Williams Institute here at UCLA and its centrality to the case, and not least of all because David Boyes, chief litigator, uh, was agreed to come and uh, join us here, and we're just delighted about that. Uh, okay, uh, so just a few words about the chronological framework. I'll leave the history to Nancy. I'll just tell you the chronology. Um, in 2004, uh, Mayor uh, Gavin Newsom of San Francisco began issuing uh, marriage licenses to same-sex uh, couples. Uh, this did not last very long. Uh, he was forced to suspend uh, his granting of these licenses. And it was not until 2008 that uh, when the California Supreme Court ruled uh, basically that laws to halt same-sex marriage were unconstitutional, uh, uh, with respect to the uh, California um, Constitution, uh, that the way was opened up again. And, um, and it was opened up for the opponents as well in November 2008, I'm sure you all remember, uh, in, in the most expensive proposition battle in California history, and that is saying something. Um, proposition 8 uh, passed uh, adding to uh, the Declaration of Rights in the California Constitution, the definition of marriage as between one man and one woman. Uh, in May of 2010, uh, the district court uh, in San Francisco ruled that um, the proposition uh, violated the 14th Amendment guarantees of the US Constitution. Uh, the current state of things is that inasmuch as both the former and present governor have refused to defend the case, which is what also Obama uh, and Holter just decided. Uh, we await a ruling from the state Supreme Court this September as to whether uh, uh, the, uh, the group of people who pushed the, um, who pushed the proposition in the first place have any standing uh, to continue to defend Proposition 8. Uh, so that brings us to uh, to uh, February 2011. Uh, let me just introduce our three speakers. Nancy Cott, who's the one in the middle, is a Jonathan Trumbull Professor of American History at Harvard. She's also the director of the Arthur and Mary Schlesinger Library uh, of Women's History at Harvard, and in her spare time, she's the director of the Charles Warren Center at Harvard. <laughs> her books have been foundational in the field of women's history, and uh, her most recent book called Public Vowels, a History of Marriage and the Nation, not vowels, vowels. A History of Marriage and the Nation is uh, here. Uh, she can sign it for you if you buy it. And uh, she has been my friend for 40 years. Lee Badgett uh, is Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for Public Policy and Administration at UMass Amherst. She is, however, connected with us at UCLA by being the Research Director of the Williams Institute. Um, she is the author of uh, several books, including her most recent book, which is also here, When Gay People Get Married, uh, 2009, and both Nancy and Lee testified as expert witnesses. Um, our final and star speaker is David Boys, chairman of the law firm of Boys, Schiller, and Flexner. He began here in California at the University of Redlands, but got his real degrees from Northwestern, Yale, and NYU. <laughs> He has a long and varied history defending the public, uh, both within and against the government. He's also the lawyer for NASCAR, is that right? Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, he was, of course, the lead counsel in uh, Vice President Al Gore's litigation concerning the 2000 presidential election, which unfortunately he lost. 
Um, and as you all know, he joined, I don't mean he lost, I mean Gore lost. Um, he joined with uh, Ted Olson in a historic legal team to challenge uh, the constitutionality of California's Prop 8, and he will be our third speaker. I want to discuss this afternoon some of the stakes involved in making a historical case for same-sex couples marriage rights. As a historian, I've written or signed a number of declarations, amicus briefs, and expert reports in state-level marriage cases since 2000. Uh, Perry v. Schwarzenegger, though the only federal case in which I've worked, um, was certainly the most exciting. The institution of marriage, as it has been regulated and practiced in the United States, has not been static over the past two centuries. It has been repeatedly reinterpreted and modified in ways significant enough to alter the very character of marital roles and requirements. And these changes in marriage have been brought about by the actions of state courts and legislatures responding to economic and social change in family lives and in work roles. Now, opponents of equal marriage rights for same-sex couples assert, however, that marriage has always meant one and the same thing since time immemorial. They assume they have the past on their side. They cite what they see as tradition. Historians can play an important part here because the conflict between actual history and assumed tradition has made it necessary to clarify the historical record. And what is the tradition that opponents of equal marriage rights claim is dispositive? That marriage has always been between a man and a woman. So far as it goes, this is a fair observation about marriage in the cultural tradition of Western political theory as it has been inflected by Christianity. It's not the case for every culture, certainly. But the question remains within our political tradition, uh, what, what else has marriage been about? The claim of tradition about the man-woman pair is hardly comprehensive. Uh, so one has to ask, what else is marriage for? And since marriage in the United States is a civil institution created by state laws, this query about the purposes of marriage should be addressed from the point of view of the state. What um, the state's interests in marriage have been and are is in part a historical question, which intelligent and fair research can weigh in upon. Inevitably, however, the parties involved in these marriage suits have understandings of marriage that step outside the state's interests. Common sense about marriage enters, inevitably. Uh, that makes things messier. As Clifford Gertz so memorably observed, I quote him, common sense is not what the mind cleared of Kant spontaneously apprehends. It is what the mind filled with presuppositions concludes. Counsel for the defendants who supported Proposition 8 argued um, for the common, I'm quoting them, the common sense proposition that the institution of marriage has virtually always and everywhere been defined as a union of man and woman because its central animating societal purpose has always and everywhere been to channel potentially procreative sexual relations into enduring stable family unions for the sake of producing and raising the next generation, end quote. Now you'll note these two claims about always and everywhere, the kind of supra-historical claim that makes historians shudder. The work of historians in such cases is to detail a view of marriage in this nation's history informed by historical research and knowledge as against what is said to be traditional. I've found it essential to stress several points in this task. First, I emphasize that marriage has been established and regulated by civil and not religious authorities through the entire history of the United States. The actions of state legislatures and courts have defined marriage and continue to have the power to redefine it. This, this is news to many people. 
Also, I emphasize the several dimensions of the state's purposes in marriage that lie outside of the institution's potential to produce children. I try to fill in a more complicated portrait of what the state gets back from marriage. Now, looking over the longer historical span, from the point of view of sovereign authorities, marriage is firstly about governance. That's why European kings wrested power over marriage from the church between the 15th and the 18th centuries. Marriage put women, children, and other dependents under the governance of male household heads who themselves were governed directly by the sovereign. Marriage required these fa uh, male household heads to take economic responsibility for their dependents in return for political power over them. Binding men to support their wives and all their other dependents was part of the sovereign's larger purpose of governance and public order in the institution of marriage. Today, marriage still answers to the state purposes of creating order and economic benefit because it sets the basis for stable rather than transient households and mandates the couple's support for one another and their dependents thus limiting the public's liability. Singling out only the reproductive potential in marriage deeply underplays these other reasons why the state bothers to license marriages. These other purposes would be fostered by enabling couples of the same sex to marry. Advocates who focus completely on the procreative aspect of marriage ignore the state's interest in making adult couples responsible for one another's support, as they are indeed today through legal marriage, and the social welfare purpose and public economic benefit inherent in that mutual responsibility. Um, perhaps the most important point that historians can make is about change over time. Marriage has not been one and the same thing from time immemorial. The institution has lasted, I believe, not because it is static, but because it is resilient and has evolved in response to social change. Couples of the same sex, of course, hope that it will change again to include them. I stress changes in three important areas, which I will simply name since I have little time today. Um, first, regarding uh, marriage as gender prescription. The past two centuries have seen immense change in legal transformations of spousal roles and in the relationship of husband to wife. State legislatures and courts gradually over a period of at least 150 years unraveled the ancient doctrine of coverture or marital unity which subordinated the wife to her husband. Marriage today under a legal regime of spousal gender neutrality and equality is a vastly different institution from what it was a century ago when the legally required roles of husband and wife were assigned by gender. Second, regarding marriage and racial formation. Since the era of the American colonies, civil authorities used laws prohibiting and criminalizing the marriage of whites to persons of color to create a hierarchy of races, usually citing the natural basis for having such laws. The California Supreme Court led the way in striking down the state's law of that type in 1948. And 20 years later, the US Supreme Court did the same for the nation, thus recognizing a practice that was three centuries old for what it was the use of marriage rules in the interests of white supremacy. And third, regarding divorce, the liberalization of grounds for divorce over time and then the insti uh, instigation of no-fault divorce have re-emphasized that marriage is based on freely given consent of the two parties and it has removed the state from precise definition of spousal roles and left the definition of how people enact their roles as spouses up to the couple themselves. A faithful historian does not have to stretch in order to assert this extent of change in marriage over time. Nonetheless, the tradition being voiced by opponents of marriage rights, to them, the marital family is one thing 
forever and always, and that one thing is reproductive. To them, progeny is the purpose of marriage. Their view naturalizes the institution, founds it in the law of nature rather than in positive laws, thus minimizing the state's prerogative in marriage definition. This view is literally a throwback to the 19th century. The author of the first American treatise on domestic relations, which was published in 1851, this was Joel Bishop, affirmed that marriage is a civil, not religious status, but further claimed that it was founded in the law of nature. The same, I quote him, the same law of nature which gave strength to the man and feebleness and dependence to the woman, end quote, and thus also authorized the husband's, quote, right to command, end quote, and the wife's, quote, duty of obedience, end quote. The conservative side on marriage rights revivifies this law of nature view. The counsel for the defendants in the Proposition 8 case said in his closing argument, and I quote, the first purpose of matrimony by the laws of nature and society is procreation, end quote. The emphasis on procreation as the raison d'etre of marriage continues no matter how often the historically accurate fact is mentioned that ability or willingness to have children has never been a requirement for marriage in the United States, nor has absence of either of these been a ground for divorce. The emphasis on progeny as the justification for marriage has also produced a series of assertions that the optimal environment for child rearing is a home in which children are brought up by their biological parents, even though no social science research confirms the truth of this claim. Some judges see the holes in this argument. In the Iowa case, Barnum v. Bryan, the court reviewed the reasoning about marriage as being all about procreation and promotion of an optimal environment for children and asked, even if that were all true, how did excluding same-sex couples advance those goals? Judge Vaughn Walker, in his opinion in Perry, was persuaded that history, along with constitutional reasoning, trumped tradition. He stated at one point, I quote, tradition alone cannot form a rational basis for a law. Rather, the state must have interest apart from the fact of the tradition itself, unquote. In this, he echoed the Connecticut opinion, Kerrigan versus Commissioner of Public Health, where the court debunked the sufficiency of tradition and quoted, uh, actually, a dissent from elsewhere, which pithily noted, I quote, the fact that same-sex couples have traditionally been prohibited from marrying is the reason this suit was commenced. It cannot be converted into the dispositive reason it cannot succeed, end quote. The Goodrich, Varnum, Kerrigan, and Perry cases are rarities, however. In more state-level cases, more numerous state cases, tradition and the procreative argument have ruled. Too many times where history has been on trial, it has lost along with the same-sex couples pursuing marriage rights. Thank you. Unlike Nancy, uh, this was actually the first time I'd ever testified in court. Um, and so I feel a little bit like a rookie who's still processing the experience. And also, unlike Nancy, I'm, a, I'm not a historian, I'm an economist. Um, we are not actually particularly known in the field of economics for being very literary, but I have continued to search for a metaphor for the experience to kind of describe it. Um, and I've experimented with you know, sports metaphors and all that kind of stuff. And finally, the other day, as I was watching Glee, I realized the right <laughs> metaphor. And that's the cheerleader pyramid, right? <laughs> So uh, as an expert witness, you're kind of somewhere up there on the top that everybody's looking, hoping you're not gonna fall off. And, uh, and you're there with this basis of people kind of holding you up. And it was uh, um, important to have uh, a history of scholarship on, uh, on the questions that uh, arose in the case. But actually, most importantly, I just wanna acknowledge how important it is to have a whole institution behind me. Um, and, uh, and in particular, I want to uh, just point out my, my two longtime co-authors in all this work, Brad Sears and Gary Gates, who's in the back. And uh, you know, over the last uh, eight years since Brad and I first did a report together, I feel like we were 
not knowing what was going to happen, but we were preparing for uh, for the day when this uh, when this case came along. Um, in fact, I don't know what the lawyers thought when Judge Walker issued four pages of questions that he wanted to have answered in the course of the trial, but we got very excited, actually, <laughs> because what we saw was an opportunity to actually take this body of work that we had put together over the years and to put it to good use. Um, so, uh, so what I wanted to just briefly describe to you today uh, is basically, you know, where the research that we have done turned out to, to matter in the course of, of this case. And the big question, um, and the one that kind of got highlighted yesterday, had to do with what's the standard of review that a, that a, uh, a law like Prop 8 um, has to pass, uh, muster on, um, in order to be considered constitutional. So is it, is it supposed to be up, uh, held up to this high standard of, of a compelling state interest? Um, and one of the important criteria for that actually is historical, which is it's about the history of discrimination against gay men and lesbians. And in several points uh, in both the testimony and in the course of the decision by Judge Walker, we saw references to this amazing project that the Brad and uh, Christy Mallory, who's here, and Nan Hunter and Lori Hazenkamp, I don't know if Lori's here, had put together over the course of a year or so where they documented in every state, including in California, a history of discrimination against lesbians and gay men. A history that it even included uh, as recently as 1999, this particular statement, which the judge did quote, uh, from um, State Senator Richard Mountjoy, that said, being gay is a sickness, an uncontrolled passion similar to that which would cause someone to rape. So as recently as, as uh, thir 12 years ago, I guess, uh, there were people who uh, were willing to, to state that, policymakers who were willing to state that very clearly. Another area that became very important has to do with um, what, the, what the state interest is in allowing uh, and, and prohibiting gay couples from marrying, um, as Prop 8 would, uh, would have done. And um, in this case, uh, one of the claims that the, the, um, the other side, the interveners made over and over again was that there would be some harm to heterosexual marriage. Although it is true that when asked very pointedly, uh, Chuck Cooper, uh, the um, chief counsel on the other side basically had to admit, I don't know, I don't know what that harm is, um, which was uh, replayed over and over again, I noticed uh, in many, uh, many points along the way. Uh, but actually, that's something that we have actually looked at uh, at the Williams Institute. Um, it's something that I studied in the course of writing the book uh, that Ellen mentioned, where we can actually look at the history of, of uh, the demographic trends in several different uh, countries and even now in some different states here in the US <coughs> to see if there are changes in those trends once same-sex couples can get married. And in fact, there don't appear to be any. Um, and even when in the course of uh, the testimony um, I was presented with sort of reams of graphs purporting to show that there was in fact some adverse trends that had, uh, that had um, taken place, uh, changes in the trends that had taken place. Um, it was one of the most fun parts. If I, if I could say that the testimony was fun, it was a lot of fun to see David Boyce kind of come up to the stand after we had gone through that and proceed to kind of pick apart uh, in, the, in the redirect um, the claims that they had been made because there really is no evidence uh, in those demographic trends. Um, and in fact, um, when, uh, when um, asked to sort of think about what the reasons for same-sex couples uh, wanting to get married might be, and therefore what the harms of not allowing them to get married might be, um, we were able to again apply Williams uh, Institute research uh, to answer that question. So it's very clear from the work that Gary's done on the census that actually same-sex couples in California and in the rest of the country look a whole lot like married different sex couples in terms of uh, the way they organize their households when they have children. Uh, the fact that they have children in the first place, even though that may be not the only reason why people want to get married, it certainly um, ha may have something to do with it. Um, and uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the diversity of same-sex couples, that they look just the same as, as same-sex couples do. So we see that in the census work. Um, why, uh, we were asked, would, uh, would the same-sex couples in California need to marry 
when they already have access to the status of domestic partnership, which uh, purports to give the same legal rights and benefits uh, that marriage provides. Well, in that case, we were able to turn to, again, uh, the story that numbers tell. And I think this is sort of one of the things that we've, we've tried very hard to, to do at the Williams Institute is to, is to use numbers creatively to, to see when they can tell us a story. So here's the story that the, the numbers tell us very clearly about marriage versus domestic partnership. Take the first year that gay couples could get married in Massachusetts. About 37% of them got married. Take the first year that any other state you want to pick that offers civil unions or domestic partnership allowed uh, uh, same-sex couples access to that right. Only 10 to 12% of same-sex couples chose to, um, to enter into, uh, into those relationships. So 37% for marriage, 10 to 12% for civil unions. That's, some people are voting with their feet. You could ask the same question about heterosexual couples who in some states, like California, are allowed to enter into those alternative statuses. In California, you have to be, at least one person has to be at least 62. Uh, but again, we see tiny, tiny numbers of different sex couples who choose to enter into those relationships when they have the option of marriage. Marriage is the one that people vote for over and over again. And when I was asked to, you know, to explain why that might be true, uh, the research that I did in the Netherlands in my book, the research that the Williams Institute did in Massachusetts and asking same-sex couples about the impact of being married shows why marriage matters in a way that domestic partnership or registered partnership or civil unions or whatever you want to call it can never actually achieve. Um, the value of marriage um, is uh, clearly uh, the, the value of the right to marry is clearly in its obvious message of equality for same-sex couples. Seeing domestic partnerships or something else as the only option available to you is a mark of second-class citizenship, and it comes through very clearly uh, in, in all the qualitative work that's been done with same-sex couples on this issue. The, uh, the value of marriage comes from the fact that people, other people recognize it. Your employer is much more likely to recognize it than it is to recognize domestic partnership here in California. Even now, you're much less likely to be offered domestic partner benefits in a, in a business, in a place of employment here in the state than you are to be offered spousal benefits. Um, uh, employers recognize it. Families and communities recognize it. Uh, one of the big ben benefits of marriage cited by couples in Massachusetts has to do with the fact that, uh, that they, are, they feel more accepted. They feel more accepted by their families, they feel more accepted by their, uh, their, um, other, uh, the other people in their lives. People with children feel more accepted by their children's schools and by their children's playmates, families. They are benefits that are accrued not just to the couple, but to, to the rest of their family as well. And then finally, there's a practical element to it. Um, this is sort of where the, the economics comes in again, um, which is that uh, the, these benefits that you get by being married and by having more people getting married, if they are offered that option, are, uh, are considerable and can be thousands of dollars. The New York Times, this is kind of after the case, but the New York Times once estimated that it could be as much as half a million dollars over the course of a relationship of a same-sex couple. That's the cost of not being allowed to marry. So the cost can be quite considerable to the couples. So a lot of our research spoke to that issue of the question of harm. The, uh, the other thing that we have, I think maybe we get, we're the most famous for at the Williams Institute, has to do with looking at the impact of, uh, the economic impact on, on, on the governments of states that are considering allowing same-sex couples to marry. And of course, at times when, uh, when budgets are under strain, this becomes much more important. Um, and in um, the, the Perry case, uh, the issue also kind of, kind of came down to the, to the county level as well. The city and county of San Francisco was a party to the case. Um, and uh, what our research clearly shows is that allowing same-sex couples to marry actually improves the fiscal position of states. And that is because of exactly what Nancy was talking about, that expectation that same-sex couples, that married couples will take care of each other. It's an expectation embedded in law, and it, you can see it in all sorts of uh, public programs that we have in the United States um, that provide, um, provide public assistance only after families have, uh, have uh, used up all of their resources or have pooled their resources to, to take care of each other. And so, you know, if you uh, don't let couples marry, then you're more likely to have uninsured people. Those people are going to cost states, counties, and the federal government uh, money because they don't stop getting sick just because they don't have insurance. 
it's going to cost the state more in those public assistance programs because you're going to have more people in need. Um, and all of those things added up um, are, uh, are a number that's in the millions in many cases. Um, and those are things that, uh, that state governments are, are, that's the level of detail that state governments are getting down to in their budgets these days. So it's not an inconsiderable burden on, on the state to not allow same-sex couples to marry. So there are lots of other things uh, that I could talk about in terms of uh, the way our research was used at the Williams Institute, but I just wanted to tell you my two favorite ones because along the way, because these are the geekiest of them all. Uh, so one of them has to do with, you know, uh, one of the other questions about um, uh, heightened scrutiny has to do with whether or not you have a class of people who you can clearly identify. And uh, I think uh, I see Ann Peblau in the audience. I know it's, uh, she was another expert witness, and there are lots of folks uh, of us who are on the stand who are asked, you know, well, how do you define sexual orientation? Can you actually ask it on a survey? I mean, that's one way to know if you've got a, a clear, a discrete group. And so we had a, a long conversation on the stand about that, which drew on uh, work that we've done on how to ask questions about sexual orientation um, as a long-term project uh, at the Williams Institute. Um, and then finally, um, still my favorite, which, which my uh, colleague Gary Gates is, is the true world's reigning expert on this matter, but census methods, like how do you actually uh, know that you have good data on same-sex couples and, you know, with the census editing measures on those surveys, are they actually producing better data or not? Uh, so there, there were lots of, uh, we, we really drilled down into the level, which I think testifying after lunch probably put a few people to sleep <laughs> uh, when I was on the stand. But anyway, it was, uh, it was a fascinating experience and it was, uh, I was so happy to be on that end of being uh, questioned by David and not on the other <laughs> end, uh, which he may tell you about. So I also just want to speak just for 30 seconds to the future um, of where we might be going, not so much in terms of policy. I mean, <coughs> policy keeps changing. We've got, uh, yeah, I could just tell you the reports that we've done just in the last two weeks um, will tell you kind of what's happening. We just issued a report on Rhode Island, We've issued, uh, which is considering a marriage bill. We've uh, just uh, done one for uh, Colorado, which has a civil union bill, and we are, um, um, also doing one for Delaware, which you'll hear about next month um, when that bill is, is introduced. So we're going to keep looking, we're going to keep studying what's happening uh, in the world when same-sex couples can get married. Who gets married and why? Um, and what does it mean for, uh, for LGBT people as a whole? And what does it mean for our society? We will be asking those questions in the future. Thanks. Trials are about law and about facts. Here, the law wasn't that unclear. The legal issue in this case was whether marriage was or was not a fundamental important right. And virtually nobody in the courtroom was prepared to say marriage was not a fundamental important right. And indeed the very fact that so much money and time and effort was spent on Proposition 8 and so much money and time and effort was spent fighting Proposition 8 after it was enacted demonstrated that both sides believed that marriage was a very fundamental an important right. The factual issues were, did the ban on marriage equality seriously harm gays and lesbians and the children that they were raising? Because if you're going to make a constitutional attack on a state regulatory scheme, you must begin by demonstrating that that regulatory scheme causes significant harm. So the first thing that we had to establish, as a matter of fact, is that the ban on marriage equality did hurt people. The second thing that we set out to establish was that the ban did not help anybody. Because if you have a regulatory scheme that helps some people and hurts some other people, whether that scheme is constitutional or not depends on a variety of legal arguments. Uh, in, including what was just raised earlier, the question as to whether you're giving strict scrutiny or what is called rational review to the legislation. Certain kinds of discriminatory actions by government are gauged under what is called the strict scrutiny rule. And what that means is that the discrimination is very strictly scrutinized. It cannot stand unless there is a very important public purpose being served. And it cannot stand, even if there is a very important public 
purpose being served, unless it is the least restrictive, least discriminatory way of addressing that important public concern. Very, very difficult for a discriminatory regime to meet those standards. Alternatively, some discrimination is judged by what is called rational basis. And that says the state can enact it as long as there is some rational basis for the legislation. Now, historically, discrimination based on race, to some extent on gender, um, and perhaps a couple of other categories, have been subject to strict scrutiny. Discrimination based on a number of other factors, including uh, wealth, uh, occupation, and the like, are judged under rational basis. The question was whether or not under, we ought to judge Proposition 8 under strict scrutiny or under rational basis. That was an important uh, question. But under either analysis, in order to justify the discrimination, the proponents had to show that it served some significant public purpose. Under the rational basis, they had to show it was at least rational to believe that it served this public purpose. Under strict scrutiny, they had to show that it really uh, was clear that it was necessary to serve that public purpose. Now, we argued, uh, consistent with the view that the Obama administration has now adopted, that because of the historical discrimination against gays and lesbians, that strict scrutiny was the proper standard. We also argued, however, that even if the standard was rational basis, the ban on gay and lesbian marriage could not withstand a rational basis analysis. And to show that, we needed to have the kind of empirical evidence that the Williams Institute and our expert witnesses provided. It's very easy outside of a courtroom to make all sorts of assertions about what has happened historically and about what will happen in the future if you allow, for example, gays and lesbians to marry. Um, when people are making speeches not subject to cross-examination, when they don't have to come in with tested empirical proof, uh, people can advocate for almost anything. And over the history of Western civilization, we have seen people advocate for almost everything. But when you have to come into court subject to cross-examination and meet the standard of admissible evidence, then things change. And what happened in this case is that we were able to demonstrate by clear, convincing, undisputable empirical evidence that first, the ban on gay and lesbian marriage seriously harmed gays and lesbians and the children that they were raising. And we were able to demonstrate that there was absolutely no evidence at all that that ban served any public purpose, that it helped anybody. And we were able to demonstrate that through our witnesses and through our evidence. But the empirical data was sufficiently strong that under cross-examination, we were able to demonstrate that from the admissions of the defendant's own witnesses. The defendants named eight expert witnesses. Uh, after depositions, and depositions in a, in a lawsuit are before the trial starts. You have a right to sit the opposing witness down in a room um, and take a deposition of that person, which is to say <coughs> ask them questions under oath that the person, as long as the questions are relevant, have to answer. Um, in the modern world, we also have the ability to take a videotape of that deposition for later use. Um, uh, after those depositions, uh, six of the eight witnesses either decided that they would rather not testify, um, <laughs> or um, the lawyers uh, representing the defendants here decided they would rather not have the witnesses testify. <laughs> and so they were left with two. Um, and both of those witnesses uh, ended up uh, admitting the essential elements of our case. And 
we were able to demonstrate, we were able to make that happen. We were able to demonstrate those facts, not because we were great lawyers, uh, not because the other side were bad lawyers. They weren't. The other side was represented by very good lawyers. Um, when you begin to hear people saying, well, they lost because they didn't have good lawyers, uh, that didn't happen. These were first-rate lawyers, very, very successful, very expensive lawyers. Um, and if you believe in the private market, you'll dem you must believe that they create values. Um, uh, but they didn't have a case. They didn't have the facts. They didn't have any empirical data to support their assertions. And the history was against them. They would come in and they would say, well, marriage has always been between one man and one woman. And on cross-examination, we would ask them, what percentage of the marriages in the world today are between one man and one woman? Well, I don't know. Well, approximately, I don't know. Um, as many as half, long pause. No, as many as a third, probably not. Um, when you look at history, history undercuts most of the myths that are out there. And by forcing people under cross-examination to confront the reality of history and not rely on simply the myths that they had been created to justify the rules that they wanted to have, we were able first to demonstrate why this ought to be subject to strict scrutiny, and second, to undercut the only argument that the other side had which was essentially a continuation of, quote, tradition, close quote. Now, as the judge held, and as the United States Supreme Court has held um, in a variety of contexts, tradition is not a justification for discrimination. If you're going to discriminate against American citizens, you must demonstrate that that discrimination is justified by the significant advantage that comes to the country. And without that advantage, without any justification, without any demonstrated reason why this discrimination should exist, that discrimination must fall as a constitutional matter. And the judge wrote a great opinion. It was an elegant opinion, and one of the things that I have said on a number of occasions is that that opinion ought to be reproduced and ought to be given to every high school civics class Everybody who goes to college ought to read that opinion because it is a statement not only of why marriage equality is constitutionally mandated. It is a discussion of how we as a free society ought to look at issues of discrimination and equality because the opinion speaks in the particular to the issue of marriage equality, but it speaks in its generalities to the issue of equality generally and what it means to be in a country that values the culture of equality and values the culture of non-discrimination. And that opinion, while greatly elegant and came from a very respected and, 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 and good trial judge, could never have been written without the evidence that we presented. Because that's what was different in this trial from the kinds of debates that swirled around before the trial. Those were debates in which each side could get up and say whatever they wanted to say. And you either believed it or you didn't believe it. Um, when you got into court, it was what could you prove? And we were able to prove that the ban on marriage equality hurt people, and that the ban on marriage equality didn't help people. And the case was as simple as that. When you, get, when you come right down to it, when you strip away all the legal arguments and all of the rhetoric, it comes down to two simple factual propositions. This discrimination hurts people. This discrimination doesn't help anybody. And by demonstrating that, through history, through empirical data, we were able, I think, to move not only the court to make the decision it did, 
but to help to move the broader debate about marriage equality in ways that I think we are beginning to see some of the effects of. I think that the decision that we got from the Obama administration yesterday is not unrelated mm -hmm. to the decision that Congress took in December abolishing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That decision itself was not unrelated to the record that was made uh, in our case and in the many other cases that are being litigated across the country. And I think that through the development of the kind of empirical data that has been developed here and that we've used in the court and elsewhere, the nature of the debate is changing. It is changing from one of prejudice and preconception to one of rational uh, discourse where people feel that they have to come forward with facts. And when that happens, discrimination cannot withstand strict or limited scrutiny. There isn't any basis for it. And when you can demonstrate that, you can move this country. We have in this country, I am convinced, a culture of equality. And that culture of equality has existed for 200 years, even though we have never practiced it. Um, <laughs> and the reason is that we have a great ability to think of the we, as in we the people of the United States, that are entitled to all these equal rights as being a limited group. 200 years ago, the we the people was essentially white male property owners, a fraction of the population. Over the history of our country, we've gradually expanded the circle of who we are to include more and more people. And the progress of the implementation of the ideals of the Declaration of Independence has been largely the expansion of the concept of who is we and who is they. And as I told the court at the beginning of the case in, before Judge Walker, we are now down to the point where essentially the last group that's outside that circle in terms of state-sponsored discrimination are gays and lesbians. Doesn't mean that we have abandoned racial, gender, or any of the other many kinds of discrimination we practice. Those are real and will continue for a long time. But in terms of state-sponsored discrimination, de jure discrimination, discrimination that's imposed by the state on its own citizens, we're basically down to this one last bastion. When we eliminate that, we will come, have come an enormous step closer to fulfilling the promise of we the people. And Judge Walker's decision and the work that many of the people in this room have contributed to have made that possible. And so we're grateful to all of you. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Mr. Boyes. Uh, I'll ask the obvious question. Uh, how does yesterday's decision by the Department of Justice impact uh, the case for you, uh, both on the uh, state Supreme Court and uh, federal Supreme Court level? I think it obviously helps. Um, how, how much it helps depends a little bit on how influenced um, the court is by the administration's position. But I think it helps in, in two important respects. First, there is the conclusion that uh, Article uh, Section 3 of DOMA is unconstitutional. And that's an uh, extremely important step, I think, in continuing the progress that I was talking about earlier. Second, embedded in that is the opinion that all gay and lesbian discriminatory uh, regulations must be judged by the strict scrutiny standard. That will make a difference not only in, this, in, the, in the DOMA area, but in all areas of existing discrimination. So I think it was, it was a very major step. Um, uh, the reasoning, I think, is, is, is quite persuasive. 
uh, and we hope the, the courts uh, adopt it. It, it. it removes something that I think, uh, it, 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 it both has an advantage and it removes a disadvantage. Um, we were always at a disadvantage when people would say, even the President of the United States um, uh, recognizes that this kind of discrimination is constitutional. Uh, that ended yesterday. I have a question, though. The motion that was filed yesterday with the Ninth Circuit asking that the stay, the, the stay be lifted uh, included reference to the uh, Attorney General's decision on DOMA. I'm just wildly curious. <laughs> did you have a heads up? No. Or did you just put that in there at the last no. minute? No, we put it in the last minute. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, that uh, motion was scheduled to be filed uh, yesterday afternoon. We got um, the um, uh, Attorney General's letter uh, like 11, 10 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, uh, now we got it on the East Coast, so we had, we had time to scurry and put it in. Uh, you, you'll notice it's kind of tacked on there. It's, it, it's, it's not really uh, sort of integrated into the uh, argument. But no, Thank we, you. We were, we were, we were, uh, we were uh, uh, not a, uh, I did not have no advance notice it was coming. There's been a lot of speculation about right. it. I'd yeah. love to be able to ask that. Thank you. Well, that's, that's good. I'm, 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 I'm glad they think we're more, uh, more on top of things than we are. I thought you had an inside track there. Right, yeah. <laughs> Could you help a layperson understand the following sequence? The California State Supreme Court said, based on the California Constitution, the ban on same-sex marriage is discriminatory and not constitutional. Then the people said, we don't care what the court said, here's how we define it. And then the Supreme Court said, well, it may not be constitutional on view, but if the people want it, okay. That always confused me. Can right. you clarify? Sure. Um, well, California is um, unusual among the states. <laughs> no, it, answer the question. In, in that, in that um, the people by the initiative, by a simple majority vote, without any participation by the legislature, can amend the Constitution. Um, uh, and what Proposition 8 purported to do was to uh, amend the Constitution. Now, uh, the California Constitution permits an amendment by um, initiative. It does not <coughs> permit them, permit initiatives to sort of totally change the Constitution. That can only be done by a different and more burdensome method. And the question before the California Supreme Court the second time was whether Proposition 8 fit into the type of change to the Constitution that was permitted by initiative or whether it did not. And so um, the California Supreme Court the first time said under the Constitution as it exists, California Constitution as it exists today, um, discrimination against gays and lesbians in marriage is unconstitutional. Proposition 8 comes along and amends the California Constitution to say that it's okay. The California Supreme Court then says, is this the kind of change to the Constitution that the people are permitted to make by the initiative process and concluded, yes, they are. Therefore, the California Supreme Court is bound, because they have to interpret the California Constitution, to apply Proposition 8. We then bring a lawsuit under the federal Constitution saying, it doesn't make any difference what a majority, a supermajority of the people any place believe ought to happen. Um, if it violates the Equal Protection and Due Process Clause, it's unconstitutional under the, under the federal constitution. You could have 99 or 100 percent of the voters in, in California vote that we ought to have an established religion. That's still unconstitutional under the federal constitution. You can have everybody in California say, um, we want to uh, discriminate against uh, African Americans in school. We want to prevent whites and blacks from marrying. Couldn't happen under the federal constitution. And so the last step is to say, okay, the California Supreme Court has said that the California constitution permits this discrimination. 
the next step is, does the federal constitution uh, permit this kind of discrimination? Is it possible for you to make a prediction of when you think same-sex couples will be able to marry in California? <laughs> <laughs> I wish it were. I, I, I wish it were. Um, but um, as you may know, uh, yesterday we filed a motion with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals to lift the stay. Uh, if that um, motion were granted, uh, then people could get married. Um, the California, the uh, California Supreme Court is looking at a standing issue that has been referred to it by the Federal Court of Appeals, and they may not reach that issue until the fall. If they don't reach it until the fall, we don't get a decision from the Federal Court of Appeals until the end of this year, maybe even uh, early next year. So unless we get the stay lifted, um, it's going to continue to be a frustratingly long period of time. I have uh, one quick question for David Boyce and then another question for uh, Lee Badgett. The quick question for uh, Mr. Boyce is, I love the cliffhanger, so how, what is the percentage of the world that it, for whom marriage is between a man and a woman? And my second question is, what is for uh, Ms. Badgett, what is the state of the research on same-sex parents? Um, I've just heard the argument that children growing up without a mother and a father are subject to some sort of social harms which I imagine might have entered into the arguments for this case. Okay. I, I think it's probably somewhere between 25% and, and, and a third of the world. 90% um, uh, of the um, uh, marriages in many places in the, in the world today are polygamous. Um, uh, and um, uh, when you add all of them together, it's a little hard to tell because you don't have really good statistics. Uh, from places in Asia, like China and India. But you take everything together, and uh, less, certainly less than half, which was really the main point of the question, um, uh, represent, uh, represent that. And of course, even, f even fewer uh, represent what we think of as a traditional marriage, where the man and the woman get to choose each other. Um, uh, in, in the vast majority, uh, vast majority of marriages still today, our arranged marriages if you take the entire world, not the United States. Yeah, on, on the other question, um, there's a great deal of evidence that was sifted through by, um, by an expert witness in the case that suggests that, that there's no evidence of harm to children who are raised by same-sex couples or by gay and lesbian parents, sort of more broadly. Um, again, some of that actually has been done by one of our uh, scholars at the Williams Institute, Nanette Gartrell, uh, but a whole bunch of other people there lots and lots of such studies, and they've all had that very clear conclusion. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, the, the um, myth that children are better when they're raised by two biological parents is something that even the experts on the other side admitted there was no support for, because what they did is they defined two biological parents as any two married people whether they had adopted the children or not. They just defined them as biological. Um, and when you start changing your definitions, you can come up with any kind of statistics you want. <laughs>